All right, welcome to another video. Uh, this time will be a little bit different. We'll be doing some uh, some drawing. Uh, so we'll do that in a little bit. But first, uh, let me demo what I worked on uh, this week. So my goal was to use MakePad, um, which is an editor and also a library for building um, for, for building cross-platform and web-based applications in Rust. Um, and so I wanted to use that library to build what I've been building and building uh, over and over in the last couple of weeks, which is a simple point cloud renderer. And so I did that. So let me show you that. So this is MakePad running. Here we have uh, a little 3D representation. Uh, I actually made it so that you can actually pan around uh, right now. In the previous demos, we would just have like a top-down view that looked like this. But now we can actually uh, see the entire scene, uh, which is nice. I wanted to uh, see how how to do something more complicated like this within MakePad. Uh, and it, uh, it works pretty well. Uh, and we, of course, have uh, our slider where we can drag through and kind of see exactly uh, what happens. And uh, of course, the whole point of this is that it's so cross-platform that you can even run this in WebAssembly, which is uh, quite unusual. And so here we have the same thing. It works exactly the same way. It's a little bit slower. Uh, it's not quite as fast as uh, uh, the C++ implementation that I did in the first week, which I also managed to run both natively and in WebAssembly, uh, because a couple more copies are involved right now. That's a limitation of their current API, but it looks like that wouldn't be too hard to, to fix. I just uh, didn't get around to that, and I would actually have to change their API a little bit. But uh, as you can see, it works uh, it works pretty well, and of course, the whole point of this is that this is a lot more scalable than my uh, initial solution in um, uh, in C++, because there we used uh, a library called uh, dir uh, uh, im GUI, which is like an immediate mode GUI, graphical user interface, um, which means that you can draw things like sliders and so on on the screen there, but it was quite limited in what you could do with it. Um, the styling and so on was pretty hard coded. You could modify it a little bit, but this is really what MakePad is offering is really more of a um, complete uh, system for building uh, much more complicated applications and styling them exactly the way you want and doing a lot of the rendering on the GPU and so on. So it's uh, it's pretty cool, and I wanted to spend most of this video actually explaining in a bit more detail how it works. So last time we did a bit of an overview because I had uh, done some research already and talked to the, the founders a bit. But this time uh, I've learned a lot more, and so I can give a little bit... Um, better of a tutorial on what actually goes on uh, inside. So let me switch over to this view. So let's see. This is all, this is all very professional, guys. <laughs> let's see if, uh, if we can get this to work. OK. So basically, um, yeah, where do we start? So we have um, at the beginning of an application, this is very typical in games, but also other applications, right? Is you have your render loop. And so this is actually platform specific. Uh, this is uh, platform specific because uh, in different uh, systems, you have a different way of uh, deciding when you should render the next frame. Uh, for example, in um, uh, if you use WebAssembly, and uh, the browser has an API called uh, request animation frame. And you should typically use that to say, let's uh, let's render our next frame. Um, uh, in other, yeah, like there's, there's just uh, some, some differences there. And so when you have uh, the render loop, um, what it will do uh, uh, on, each, on each loop, it will uh, emit a bunch of events. And this is also uh, platform specific, right? Because uh, you get like mouse events and stuff like that in the browser in a very different way than you would get on Windows or on Linux and so on. And then it does the actual um, it generates a draw tree. So this this is called uh, this is called drawing. And what this produces, um, so yeah, the, the events, yeah. Anyway, um, 
the, the drying, that this is the most interesting part uh, for now, uh, this produces um, uh, basically what, a, what we can call a, a, a draw tree. So this is a, a draw tree. And then when we have this draw tree, it can be painted. So these are the, the three sort of like most high level steps. Um, so probably the most interesting thing to look at is uh, what, what does this draw tree look like in the first place? And then how does it connect to, um, to what you're doing in user space effectively, right? Like as a consumer of the library uh, during your drawing phase to produce it. So a draw tree, um, okay, so the most important um, sort of data structure that they have is uh, this thing called the context, CX. And this is just a huge, huge thing that contains all sorts of different things. And uh, it also contains some specializations for, for the uh, platform and so on. But um, in general, it contains just a lot of stuff. So some of the things that it contains are like shaders, right? So there's like uh, just a list of shaders of all the shaders that you can be using in your thing. Um, and sort of all the other things that we're going to mention uh, that are part of the draw tree are actually represented here. So uh, we will have things uh, called views. Um, we will have things uh, called draw calls. Um, at some point we might talk about passes. Um, I think, yeah, so let's, let's start with those. Uh, so, so all of these are just on this context uh, uh, object, and uh, in a sense, yeah. When whenever, whenever we're referring to these these views or these draw calls or these passes, we don't have any um, uh, pointers or stuff like that. We just have um, indexes into these uh, long lists, right? These arrays, or in um, Rush you call them vex, like vectors. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so this draw tree, what does it really look like? So, uh, sort of at the top, um, you have like a window. We won't talk too much about that. You can even have multiple windows. Um, within a window, you can uh, have uh, uh, like a pass. We might, we might talk a little bit more about this. But then where it really gets interesting, so now we get to sort of the meat of the, uh, the draw tree, we have uh, views and draw calls. So um, every draw call, uh, okay, so let's, let's say that we just want to render one thing on the screen, right? Like just one rectangle. Um, how, do, how would we do that? Basically what you would do is you would put a draw call here and this draw call has a bunch of stuff on it, right? It has uh, the shader ID. So this will refer, you know, to this uh, to the shader. And again, this is not a pointer; it's just uh, just an index into it. They could have also called it like shader index or something. Um, and that that is what will actually run on the on the GPU, right? Um, See, is this focus? Yeah. And then um, the other important thing that you have here is um, uh, what is called um, uh, instances. So for example, the shader can contain the information of how to draw a rectangle, right? And that is actually a very common thing that, uh, that you do in uh, uh, user interfaces is almost everything is rectangles. And that that actually has some some interesting benefits. Um, or like yeah, you can you can use that fact uh, in an interesting way for clipping and scrolling and so on. I don't know if we'll if we'll get to that. Um, so yeah, this this shader to elaborate a little bit more. It contains um, like the the actual shader. Uh, like there's like a, a tip, typically uh, typically in a different language like uh, GLSL. You have a um, um, basically two things, right? You have a, a vertex shader and a pixel shader. So vertex and pixel shader. And for both of these things, 
Um, they, they actually have a custom language, so you write it kind of in Rust, uh, but then it compiles to whatever shader language the platform that you're on uses. So that can be a GLSL or H HLSL, and they do that translation for you. And the shader compiler also has some additional features. So uh, for example, you can uh, specify a geometry. Uh, and this geometry basically says, for example, this, these are the vertexes that you typically have for a rectangle. Um, and then it will use uh, instance rendering, uh, which is basically you can use those same vertexes and inst instantiate them over and over with uh, like different offsets or different colors or other attributes that you pass to it. But like the initial vertex information is uh, shared. And this is, is especially useful if you have much more complicated shapes, right? Like um, uh, you can have like a tree or something, right? And in your game, you can have like thousands of trees, but they all use the same base geometry with some tweaks. Um, that you can specify for each instance individually, but this way you don't have to generate uh, every single like triangle that you're going to render in your scene individually, right? So that's a that's a huge benefit um, uh, if you have a lot of um, if you have a lot of uh, vertexes to render. In the case of a of a rectangle, it's a little bit less interesting because you know you you just have like two triangles and so you kind of like save like uh, save only a little bit there it's not a very complex shape but anyway they, they have an abstraction where you can say uh, just give me this geometry and it will automatically um, sort of use that when you use that shader so that's that's interesting and then the other thing that they do custom here is um, your instance data uh, if you put it on a uh, uh, rust struct right so so often um, often you would you would say something like uh, you know if you're um, if you're going to draw a button, right? Like you would have uh, something like a struct uh, uh, a draw button, and this uh, draw button would have a couple of fields, and they would be um, those would actually be the fields that you would see in the shader as well, and so they. Uh, if you were to do this manually, you would have to manually make sure that the fields that you use in your shader line up exactly with the fields that you have like in your Rust struct. Uh, but they have a way to just use that directly and generate uh, that for you so that it doesn't get out of sync. So th those are two of the things that they do custom in their, in their compiler. Um, it's kind of interesting. I don't know, uh, th th there's probably more things that I haven't encountered yet. But those are some uh, some of the things, and so okay. So when you have a draw call like that, you have a shader um, uh, associated with it using a shader ID. Then you have the actual instances, and so this is actually just a byte array, right? So this is just a, a long array full of full of numbers, and this will be sent directly to the GPU uh, when when we go and paint. Okay, so this is a very very simple uh, uh, example of what a draw tree can look like. And then, um, then we go to painting, right? So what the painting does is it iterates sort of like recursively down this tree. Uh, well, we don't really see the recursion here yet, but um, uh, it uh, comes upon uh, this draw call. Um, one of the things that it will check is uh, if it has been changed since the last uh, paint, right? So it will have like a dirty flag. And when you generate this tree for the very first time, this dirty flag will be true uh, by default. And so when we then paint it, it will be set to false. Um, but yeah, it will at this point uh, take this shader ID, uh, like um, actually use the shader. Um, it caches the compilation of the shader and such, of course. And then it will send our instance array to the GPU and, uh, and, and, and make a call to actually do the drawing on the screen. And so if you were to do this and you would have, for example, this instance just set to like, you know, uh, like uh, if, if, if you're working with just drawing rectangles, then the most basic thing that you can do um, in, in your instances is to say there's like two floats, right, uh, in our, in our uh, draw button structure or something, right? So you would have like, uh, you could, for example, if you want, say uh, our draw button is just like, a float x 
So this is like F32 float and then a float Y, F32. And you can also use like, they have a shorthand for this. Uh, but then in any case, uh, if you do it just like this and you just want to draw one rectangle, one button, so to speak, and it always has like the same size, say in, in our example here, then you can say, you know, this is just an array with 0, 0.0 and 0, 0.0. And then that will draw um, a, uh, a rectangle at, uh, at that location. But in reality, of course, you would typically also include the size, maybe a color, um, uh, and so on. So that is that is in a very basic, yeah, that is the most simple draw tree that you can have. And so if you want to draw multiple uh, multiple rectangles, then that's already very simple, right? You just make this, this list longer. And if you want to draw rectangles and then you want to draw text inside of those, right, you would probably have another draw call here. Uh, to have another draw call with its own shader ID um, that is some sort of like text text renderer. And then it would have like uh, the instance data would probably be the text itself, uh, maybe some information also about the location and the size of the text and so on. Uh, and then uh, the, the order um, matters, right? Like it will draw things by default on top of it, unless you have like a different Z uh, position. In that case, yeah, you, you, you can do some, some, uh, some, some tricks with, uh, with out of order rendering uh, in some cases, but, um, but typically you would do it kind of like this. Okay, so we could just have only draw calls, uh, right? But then one of the problems uh, that you get is how do you, um, uh, how do you group things together? Like conceptually, that might be useful, but also how do you deal with uh, scrolling, right? So we haven't really talked about, you know, if you have a rectangle somewhere, but it's it's supposed to be actually in some sort of container that uh, that can be scrolled, then maybe that rectangle is sort of uh, off the screen at this point, right? So how would that work? So, you know, we would basically Let's just draw this again. We have our window and then maybe our pass. And then um, uh, then we can, yeah, again, have like draw calls, but a, a special kind of draw call in some sense is uh, uh, what is called a view. And so a view has a bunch of uh, information on it. Um, uh, it can, I think, like you have like a special version of the view, which is a scroll position and so on. Um, and actually I should call this, I think in the code, this, this is actually called a CX view because there's also another kind of view and we'll get to that in a second. So this is like the view that is part of the, the draw calls. And then underneath of you, you can have uh, draw calls again. So, uh, I think this is what it's called there. And then of course you can have like a CX view here again and, uh, and more draw calls and so on. And so this is, uh, this is where the recursive ex aspect comes in. You can draw, uh, you can nest these views uh, sort of in arbitrary ways. Um, and yeah, that is, uh, Okay, so we have this uh, this uh, tree. Uh, these draw calls can be can be dirty or not, uh, and uh, these views have information uh, about uh, 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 scrolling. And the way that that works is uh, is quite interesting. So uh, if you if you realize that that pretty much everything is done using rectangles, um, then you can see how you can do this. Uh, almost entirely on the on the GPU. Um, so, for example, if this if this view here says you know it's, it's actually sort of like this size, uh, but its content its content inside is kind of like this, right? So it's scrolled. We've scrolled down a little bit, and so this is sort of like you don't see it, and this you also don't see. And like the scroll bar, there will be a scroll bar here that's sort of like it's in the middle, right? We scroll down a little bit. Um, then how, 
how sh should this uh, trickle down to these uh, draw calls that we have underneath? So basically the way that this works is there's like, there's some default uh, attributes that are being passed uh, to, uh, to the shaders um, where you basically, I, I don't know if they're attributes or, or uniforms, they think that they're uniforms, right? Because it's, it's sort of the same for everything that is uh, drawn uh, inside of this draw call, inside of this view. So um, one, once you know this, right? Like, uh, so um, uh, basically still on the CPU, it will, it will go down this tree and see, okay, this, uh, uh, this thing has been scrolled. Maybe there was just a scroll event or something. And so we're repainting. And so now it will call this draw call uh, uh, with, uh, with this offset being passed to the shader. And what does the shader do, right? So the shader might want to like draw a rectangle here or something, uh, but it, it gets this information that this is, uh, is the clip region. And so um, uh, we basically know that uh, like in, in the vertex uh, shader, you can you can say you know just don't render this I guess or like uh, it will be sort of like um, off the screen like rendered off the screen or something like that I don't know exactly how that part works but if if we have this uh, this rectangle for example then you can imagine that uh, these are the original uh, vertices right and so uh, it's transformed so that we get like a vertex here and a vertex here. Uh, and at the same time, it also transforms um, sort of the, the coordinates within the rectangle so that the pixel shader will still think that the top of the rectangle, it, it will think that the top of the rectangle is sort of uh, what, what would otherwise be the middle of the rectangle. I don't know if this, if this makes sense, but basically in the, sh in the vertex shader, all the coordinates are um, transformed in such a way that to the pixel shader, uh, it looks like, you know, uh, even though we're at the top of this rectangle, where it, it thinks that we're kind of like drawing in the middle of the rectangle, and so this, um, I believe, is a technique called like um, axis-aligned clipping. So you can do this clipping because uh, the clip the clip actually lines up with um, with your original axis of your shape that you were drawing because it's a rectangle. Um, and you, yeah, and because you you have this, um, you know that um, the output of your of your uh, uh, vertex shader will always uh, be the same number of vertices, right? Like you're never going to have to generate more vertices or something, right? And that could be the case if we have a much more complex shape, right? Like if we have some sort of star or whatever, and we're going to sort of like cut this off at an arbitrary point, right? Like now you might actually get sort of like more vertices here because uh, here you get like two vertices instead of one that you had here. And so that, this, that is not possible in a vertex shader. You can only do a one-to-one -one mapping, um, but we have that guarantee with rectangles that we never increase the number of vertices that we need to, uh, that we need to output. So that, that's, a, that's a very uh, interesting trick. So uh, yeah, that is how things like scrolling and clipping and so on works. Uh, another thing that you can do um, that we can briefly talk about are these passes, right? So uh, we actually saw this in uh, in the demo earlier where I had sort of a 3D view uh, that I could pan around and so on. But then outside of that, I still had other uh, UI elements. And the way that that works is you can say, I want another pass. Uh, and actually these passes are in some sense kind of nested under these views in some, some way. I, yeah, I, I won't get into the details exactly there, but there's some sort of dependency that is known. And so, um, yeah, if you have these passes, uh, yeah, you can have another pass and do completely other things there. And this pass can render to a texture. And for example, this texture can be the instance of, of one of these draw calls in some sense, or like it, it can be the uh, yeah information that is associated with this draw call, not not an instance, but like a, a texture or so. Um, uh, and so, yeah, the rendering system knows how to how to associate this. It knows to render this pass uh, uh, before this pass, and um, and so yeah, you can you can do uh, interesting things because you just get sort of a blank canvas that you can mess with. Uh, however you like, 
and uh, then at the end of it, it just gets embedded uh, in here. Uh, that embedding is a little bit expensive, but it's not that expensive. So you can do it pretty performantly for uh, like the application that I just demoed, for example. And, and of course, yeah, you can also have like multiple windows, I think, although that doesn't work in WebAssembly, maybe. Um, yeah, but everything else. Uh, yeah, so then the other thing that is interesting about their implementation is that this stuff is roughly the same, like it's basically the same between uh, uh, the different platforms. Uh, but they have like a completely custom implementation for each platform to to actually make these calls and do the rendering itself. So that is how they have uh, that's how they have organized this um, in their code base. Um, and that's interesting because you could imagine, you know, always rendering to OpenGL, for example, and then using some uh, library that translates between OpenGL and uh, DirectX, for example, and that exists um, but it has some more overhead so if you have like a, a good abstraction like this um, then you can implement it directly against the platform specific API and you uh, you don't get that overhead uh, but of course it, it limits a little bit the um, uh, the abstraction that you get right because like this abstraction has to has to really support all of the things that are possible uh, in the different um, uh, in the different implementations. Although I guess you can short circuit that in some cases. So, okay, so that is how you generate, um, or like, yeah, once you've generated this, how it gets painted, right? So it just iterates through all of this based on whether it's dirty or not, it will um, upload uh, uh, the instance buffers. Um, uh, if, uh, if it's not dirty, then it will just reuse the buffers that it had uh, already associated, uh, so that's quite nice. So in, in many cases, only parts of your UI change. It still has to make the draw call, but uh, it doesn't have to um, upload new data. Uh, there are other rendering systems, right? Like if you look at the browser, for example, where they might even skip, um, uh, skip the drawing. Uh, I think I saw some commented out code in the MakePad library where they were also playing with what if you only like redraw or like repaint um, a part of the uh, a part of the screen and you get into like funky stuff with uh, z values and stuff and um, yeah it might it might be complicated but there's already an interesting abstraction right of like this uh, this view where you can maybe say okay maybe we would just want to repaint a particular view or so but right now they just do the entire thing and that uh, seems to be seems to be fine in practice uh, I don't know if uh, if they'll ever run into uh, issues issues with that, um, but uh, yeah, they they might they might. I'm not I'm not too much of a graphics expert, but uh, I'm learning uh, learning pretty quickly. So then, how do you generate this thing? And that is where it gets like a little bit funky, maybe like, and where the their API seems to be uh, a little bit uh, more rough, I would say. So basically the way it works is you have, you have your application, right? And so you start with, um, with some sort of struct uh, that represents uh, your app. Uh, and your app roughly has, uh, has two methods that it has to implement, right? Like there's, there's sort of like a, uh, like a handle, handle event method uh, and like a draw. This handle event method gets, uh, gets a context and it gets an event. And this draw uh, thing, uh, I believe, only gets uh, a context. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have to, like there's different ways in which you can output this, this stuff directly, right? Like you could, in theory, call the low level calls uh, man manually where you say, you know, uh, uh, instantiate another draw call, um, instantiate another view, um, update the, the, uh, the array of instances uh, associated with this draw call, register a new shader. So those functions are in fact uh, exposed. And so you could call them directly on your context, but they have a bit of a layer on top of this. So uh, in their current structure, the way that you would do it 
uh, is you would have, um, for example, if you would have like uh, a button, right? You might you might have like uh, uh, like I don't know, like some uh, like my my primary button, my OK button in my dialog, right? So you would have maybe like an OK button uh, on your um, on your app struct, and of course, like this abstract itself also gets passed in here as self. Uh, you would write that as self in, in Rust. In other languages, you can sometimes omit that, but uh, whatever. So you would have like a button and maybe that is like a button uh, struct, uh, or you would, have, uh, in our case, we have a slider, right? So let, let's actually maybe go with the slider example. That might be better. So we have like a slider uh, and that's maybe a slider struct. And then maybe you would call something like, uh, in your draw function, you would maybe call like, you know, self dot slider uh, dot draw. But the slider might at this point not know anything else, right? Like things like its dimensions and so on. And so now you get into an interesting question already, right? Like you can either choose uh, on initialization, right? Like when this struct gets created, this abstract, do I instantiate the slider with a bunch of information that it uh, needs to know? And you could do that if it, for example, never changes, right? So you could say here, like, um, you know, if uh, like we would have like a new function for, uh, for, for our app. Um, and here, yeah, maybe, you know, you would return uh, an app and this app, what would it have? Well, it might have like a slider that is like slider, uh, slider new. Uh, and it's like, it goes from minus a hundred uh, to plus a hundred, right? And you could say that here, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. Um, the other way that you can do it is when you make this draw call to the slider, you can say, okay, at this point, we are going to uh, pass in this information. And that way, you know, if this information is dependent on some other, some other state that you might have in your app, you can, at the time that it's relevant, which is, you know, when you are actually going to draw it, uh, update, update it and make sure that it draws, uh, sort of like, yeah, with the right dimensions and so on based on, uh, uh, based on, on like the minimum and the maximum values, for example. And so typically you would also pass in the value itself, right? So if this is our range, say, then maybe we have like a value of like 20 that we actually, uh, that we actually draw. Okay. So, what this then done, uh, does under the hood is like in the slider um, implementation, we also have have a draw. You can have multiple draws too, right? Like there's nothing really telling you what to do here exactly. Uh, but then, yeah, maybe in this draw, uh, we uh, uh, we have something even more low level, like like a rectangle, right? So maybe maybe it does something like. Um, uh, uh, self dot rect uh, dot draw, and this might have like some more uh, like low level information, right? Like these these might might be actual dimensions or so. Uh, but if we want to draw like a lot of rectangles, then it becomes a little bit more interesting because. Um, yeah, in a lot of cases you have kind of like this high level API where it says like just draw one rectangle like this. Uh, but if you want to do something more low level, then you kind of have to. Uh, use a more low-level API and supply one of these. Um, uh, yeah, you can supply one of these instance arrays directly. I think often if you do one of these higher-level APIs and you just you know call it with multiple rectangles, it will kind of construct one of these instance arrays uh, manually. So that that can still happen under the hood. Um, but if you want to do that yourself, sort of like the more low-level API is. Uh, um, something like, uh, like, uh, um, uh, like draw many instances. And this will return, this will return what is called an area. And an area really is sort of a pointer back into this draw 
tree, right? So you would have like um, these draw calls and this area says, well, this refers to this particular draw call. Uh, and it's like the instances associated with that uh, draw call. And the, these are like the dimensions uh, and, uh, and so on. And so you can then use that area to, um, uh, to do stuff. Um, and like, yeah, change, uh, change these instances, uh, this instance array and so on. Um, yeah, okay, so that is, that is roughly, okay, so that is, that is part of it. Then the other thing is how do you get these views, right? So um, you would often also have like views on your structs. So these are different views than these views, but for example, in your abstract, you might also have something like, um, I don't know, V is our view. And the way that you would use that is you would, um, you could say, for example, here, if you want to, like, let's, uh, let's begin a new view, right? So we have uh, self.v and we do a begin view on our context. And this basically creates one of the, these context views actually on the context. Um, and then our V, I think, will we'll store like an ID, uh, an I a, a view ID, so that you can, uh, uh, yeah, it, it kind of gets associated with these uh, CX views in that way. And so then you can do all your thing, and so all the draw calls that get made right now would be nested under this uh, CX view. And then uh, finally you would say, uh, uh, you know, v.end view. And then you kind of go, go level up again and you would be appending things here again. Uh, so that is uh, how that works. And there's one, one more thing that is interesting. So when you're doing this drawing, right, you might not also always want to generate this entire tree uh, completely from scratch. And so to avoid that, uh, whatever, okay. To avoid that, what you can, uh, uh, it has basically has this mechanism where it will track for each of these views. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think it really matters where. It, yeah, it tracks it in the context somewhere. Uh, it tracks for these views if they should be redrawn, right? So not repainted because we already said that uh, we just uh, repaint everything all the time uh, with some optimization of like if um, if the instance array didn't change, it will not. Uh, re-upload that and if the geometries didn't change right like all those things that we talked about they won't be um, uh, updated and so on but other than that this entire thing gets repainted all the time but uh, drawing right like this happens on the CPU it's like the generation of this tree uh, can be quite expensive too so uh, there is I think a separate like a, a set of separate lists in the context that uh, says, okay, these are the IDs of the views that have to be redrawn. And the way that then, that then works here is this begin view kind of returns um, kind of a Boolean, not exactly, but, but sort of a Boolean that says, do we actually need to do everything that is inside here, right? So you would actually wrap this in an if, right? If we uh, need to redraw, then you do all of this. Right, including the end view, yeah. And then if not, it will just remember all of this stuff, right? So it will remember this entire tree, uh, doesn't change, um, it just uh, saves it. Um, if you do need to redraw it, then things like these areas, which are kind of like pointers into this, uh, might, might, might need some updating in some cases. Um, but that is the basic model. And there's like some some flaws with that model. Okay, so this is kind of where it gets gets interesting and where I think um, the API can can maybe use some improvement, right? If you have one of these sliders, for example, uh, that slider has to have a value, right? And in our case, we need to know the value of that slider um, up here. Um, actually, let's let's first talk about events. Events are important for this story. 
right? So we established, if we go back all the way to the render loop, uh, the first thing that happens in the render loop is we emit e uh, events, and then we draw. In fact, drawing is kind of a special event, I think. Uh, that generates the draw tree, uh, and then we paint. And the pain painting doesn't involve any, uh, any of our stuff that operates uh, only, only on the draw tree. Uh, but the events, what the events can do is they can basically change one of two things, right? They can either change uh, the draw tree. So they can change the draw tree directly or they can, uh, they can mark which views um, have to be redrawn. That is, those are basically the ways in which, um, yeah, in which the latest stages here can be affected by events. So if you operate on the draw tree directly, then great, you don't have to do any drawing. You can just go to painting, right? So this just uh, modifies uh, things in the draw tree directly. So as an example, if you have these instances here, and maybe uh, one of these values in these instances is like uh, represents the color of a button. And maybe if you hover over something uh, with your mouse, you you want to redraw, or you want to just change that color and repaint. You don't need to actually generate a new draw tree because nothing fundamental has changed. It's just like one little value that has changed. So that one little value here, you know, that, that draw call gets marked as dirty. Uh, but other than that, the entire draw tree remains uh, the same. So that is if you do that. And so that's for very small things, uh, like for little animations uh, and so on. But if you actually need to change the draw tree, and often that means you know, you, you're moving something in the layout or something fundamental changes, then we need to actually uh, re redraw. But we only need to redraw part of the tree, like we said, right? So you can, for example, say, well, this view here uh, needs redrawing. And so what happens then is like if you have another view here, for example, basically the way it works is if this view needs to get redrawn, then this view also needs to get redrawn, right? Otherwise we never get here um, because we start sort of at the top and we make these calls to kind of like go deeper and deeper and generate parts of the, this tree. So, you know, if this first view needs to get uh, redrawn, then this if statement here would return true, right? Then we would go inside and do the draw calls here and it would generate uh, all of this. Um, but then inside here, it's, it's very possible that there's another CX view that doesn't need to be redrawn, right? Like if you just mark this view for redraw, then this view won't necessarily get redrawn. And then also if you get out of here, this view also won't get redrawn. So you would have another if statement maybe down here and that would return false. And so you wouldn't actually go inside that if statement. It would just uh, keep that part of the tree. Okay. So yeah, let's get back to sort of the flaw in um, one, of, one of the flaws that's, that's it's not super major, but uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can kind of imagine that with uh, more complex applications, this becomes a bit of a problem. So if you have, for example, this slider, uh, it has to have a value, right? And one place that definitely that value needs to be represented is in this instance array, right? Like otherwise it just doesn't get drawn. So somehow this value is captured in this instance array. Now, it might not be the actual value, it might be just a position or something, but it might also be the actual value. Um, and you know, like the the position of the slider can just get uh, get drawn in a in a pixel shader or something. So may maybe one of these instances, maybe one of these numbers is like our, our number twenty, right? That was our value of the slider here. So this is one place that it definitely needs to be. And so another place where it often shows up is if the slider itself has a struct uh, with that information in it. Um, right, like when we do this, uh, uh, when we make this rectangle draw call, uh, it usually makes like a copy of the struct. Uh, in our case, it would be something like draw slider. 
And so it would make a copy of this thing to append it in here. And, and so our original, right, like our uh, original struct would also have this number 20 in it. Uh, what happens if you get an event, right? If you get an event that says the user clicked on, on the slider and dragged it a little bit, right? Like after this, yeah, when this drag happens, um, uh, you want some sort of event to let uh, uh, sort of the parent know, right? Like our application might care about that is changed, but we also need to update it on the screen. Right, and so there's different ways that you can go about this. And if you're familiar with React, you might be familiar with uh, uncontrolled and controlled components. So this is a little bit similar in some sense. So if you just want to, you know, move the slider visually on the screen, you don't actually need to do that much, right? You can just say, okay, our event is emitted, and we're going to directly modify the draw tree. We're going to uh, just look at the, this instance array, find our uh, entry into it, and I think you usually do that with an area, uh, but there's, there's so many layers of, sort of like things on top that do this automatically for you uh, that I don't know exactly how it, how it finds that. But there's yeah some representation that tells you like this is where that number is in our instance uh, array, and so you just change this number and make it 30. Right? And if that is all that you care about, just the position on the screen, then we don't need to do any redrawing. We can just paint. Okay, so that, that would be great. But um, uh, if that's not the case, right? Like the, the way that this works is in our uh, app, we have this handle event thing. And so usually what you would do here is you say, okay, well, I have a bunch of children and they might care about this event. Right, like, a, like by default, just the top of your app gets the event. And so you might say, okay, well, let, let's just like call slider, uh, like self.slider uh, dot, dot handle event with, with that same context and that same event. Okay, great. So that, that is how, how it gets it in the first place. But um, this function, this handle event of the slider, can then return something, right? Like we don't just have to ignore its return value. We can say, okay, well, what if this thing uh, is like a change event? Like, like a, a slider change event or something, right? It says like the slider now has a new value. Um, and there is, in fact, like a slider implemented that kind of works like this. It can trigger uh, change events while it's changing. It can uh, emit a done event when uh, the user, for example, lets go of the slider, like uh, releases the mouse button. And so you can choose, okay, I, maybe I just want to update my UI when the user is done, or maybe I want to kind of uh, update it continuously like we, we did in our demo. And so you can, you can then choose what to do with this event, right? And presumably if our app actually cares about this number and has to use it for other things. Uh, like in our case, we had this other view, right? Like this 3D view where um, we actually uh, used the value of the slider to determine which frame from this point cloud uh, data set we actually want to show on the screen so that if you scroll the slider, uh, you, know, you, see, you see the point cloud moving around. So in our case, our app also has to have this value, right? So you would have maybe like another uh, like value on this struct. I don't know, like some, some number, right? And, uh, and so, okay, we get this change event and we update our value. And now what do we do, right? Like this value, um, we probably, uh, if, if we have something complicated enough, like in our case, the, the point cloud thing, we can't just say, you know, just redraw the tree after we fiddle with some uh, information in it. Um, we actually need to change the, the draw tree uh, more fundamentally. And this is up for debate, right? Like it, it really depends on like what, uh, what kind of uh, change you're making, uh, right? Like if, it's, uh, if you can do it purely by changing uh, some some instance array, then you don't have to regenerate the draw tree. But let's say, and currently we do, in this case, we have to uh, regenerate the draw tree. So what you would do then is you would say, okay, 
maybe um maybe we have another view that is wrapped around that um uh, that three d visualization and we say like re render that one and then we pass in this value to the draw call there um if uh it can be complicated though right like if you pass this val if you have to pass this value to to multiple other things but you don't always know which things care about it at any particular moment, then you might be just uh redrawing too much um and and so yeah there's kind of like two problems with this like one of them is you just get like this value uh all over the place right and it has to be kept in sync right so you might yeah you, you certainly get this value here you might get this value here in this draw slider structure you might get it in the app um it needs to be used uh, for this point cloud, um, which might or might not have to store it uh, if it uh, needs to, for example, look up that value in the uh, in an event or so. Um, so you just get like the same the same thing uh, uh, all over the place. And then the other the other potential problem is that it's not always clear which view sh should you uh, should you mark as uh, um, having to be redrawn. So, um, what you actually see in the in the actual Makepad application itself is that oftentimes they just they just say just re redraw everything, because it's a sufficiently complicated application that um, that you have to uh, that that they have quite a few views and so on, and they have to decide which views do we redraw, which ones don't. Um, but it's not quite complicated enough, I think, for them to have like really already have figured out uh, a nicer solution to, to how to do all of this, how to do the invalidation, how to pass around these values. So if you look at this, it, it kind of like feels like something like React a little bit, but not, not quite, right? Like in React, you wouldn't, for example, actually have a data structure that contains all of these, um, uh, yeah, all, all of these values, sort of like these sliders and these buttons that would, just be something that you would return from your from your render call, uh, very similar to our draw call, and then um, the state persistence happens of within the React system, which also has its as as its drawbacks and has as its issues. But uh, the data flow is a little bit clearer. Um, they did tell me that they're working on some ideas on uh, how to improve this. Uh, something a bit inspired by Redux and like immutable state and um, and so on. But I think even without that, like this, this fundamental model can be improved on a little bit, but I, I don't quite know what it, uh, what it would look like. I've just uh, been playing it only for, for a little bit so far. Um, and then another issue that you might have noticed is that, you know, if you have these views and they refer, refer to, um, sort of things in this tree and really that is all just stored in like these long lists here uh that this is kind of man manual memory management right so we um we kind of circumvent uh the rust system here like you could also implement this using things like um uh reference counts and so on uh, the attractive thing of this of course is that these are sort of continuous arrays which caches very well but um uh you are now doing sort of like manual pointers into these things and that has issues because uh say you have an application where you have where you can switch between two views right like you have some sort of tabs and you know whether if you click on one tab, then this uh, view gets shown. If you click on the other, the other view gets shown, something like that, right? And you want to completely hide the one that you don't care about. Um, they still stick around, right? Like, and everything that is underneath that view will still be here. Uh, there's currently, as far as I can tell, not really a way to clean up uh, any of these things. Maybe, maybe you can just create a new context or like truncate everything or something like that to create a new parser. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, there's definitely not sort of a more fine-grained way of saying like, oh, this view doesn't look in use anymore. Uh, let's remove it. So you kind of have to do that manually. That, of course, has like a benefit that if you switch back to the tab, that like a lot of stuff is still there, like that whole uh, draw tree um, 
well, I don't know if that would st still. Be. Yeah. Anyway, there there might still be some stuff there that you can uh, that you can use that will be quite fast. Um, but yeah, that is that is one of the drawbacks um, also of this uh, system. And so yeah, I I really like sort of like the underlying system, sort of this uh, uh, the way that these uh, draw trees are uh, being organized, um, the way that you can sort of do the scrolling and clipping is all very clever. The way that the instancing works and the geometry and um, there's uh, there's a lot of really good stuff there. This layer, I think, can use a little bit of improvement. Um, but hopefully now you have like a bit of a sense also of um, of how this is implemented. And if you have any suggestions, I would be very interested uh, in, in in hearing them because I, yeah, I'm just like, it's it's too different, right? Like it's too, like immediate mode kind of rendering. Well, this is not quite immediate mode, but it's like, you know, single pass. Uh, rendering is, is is a bit different than what I've uh, been used to in the past, and so this doesn't very cleanly map onto um, any models that I've seen seen in the past. But it's it's kind of close in some ways, and and kind of not so close in other ways. So yeah, that's uh, that's that. And then of course within that within this, like I've even glossed over some more details. So in the last video, I talked a little bit about how layouting works and turtles. And so you can also do that, right? You can say things like a context dot begin turtle and end turtle if you want a particular sort of like lay, uh, different kind of layout within what you're currently doing, but not create an entirely new view because a new view is kind of costly in some sense, right? Like when you create a new view, then you won't be able to reuse any of the draw calls outside of that view anymore, right? Like if you want to, draw a button outside of your view and one inside of your view, then that will be um, always like two different draw calls. And that has as like some benefits, right? Because you, you get some, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's like some strict ordering uh, to, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the rectangles or whatever it is that, that you're drawing. And, you know, if you don't do that, it, it certainly won't work for things like scrolling and so on. Though it might, I don't know. I yeah, I haven't fully wrapped my head around exactly how uh, um, how combining draw calls and so on uh, works. But that seems to be the case at least right now. That when you, when you create a new view, that you always create an uh, entirely new draw call if you even if you want to draw something of the same type as uh, something above it. Uh, so you want to kind of use views sparingly. Uh, so then if you want to do layouting or so, there's uh, some other abstractions. Uh, when you create a new view, you always get a new turtle, but you can also create a new turtle outside of the context of, uh, uh, of a view. Anyway, this is uh, probably too long already. Uh, let me just uh, switch back to the computer screen and see, uh, see if we can look at some stuff here again. Okay, so I have some ideas for next steps, what I can be working on. So there's another project called Web Render, which is uh, being used in Firefox. Uh, it's also, uh, it uses a similar model of um, kind of immediate mode to like single pass rendering where most of the stuff happens on the GPU. They also use sort of this clipping, uh, this uh, uh, axis aligned um, vertex clipping technique. Uh, they seem to to also group uh, a lot of draw calls together in clever ways, and they seem to be even more clever um, clever about it because they uh, they can do things where they know certain boxes are opaque and other boxes are transparent, and so you can layer them in uh, in various ways and. Uh, it means that you don't have to render everything. Anyway, I don't know exactly the details, but uh, of course the, the big benefits besides uh, that model is that it's uh, very mature, it's very well tested, very well docu well, not ex not super well documented, but but quite well documented for an internal rendering engine. And that's that's different than uh, than Makepad, right? Like they still have some ways to go to actually mature their library. Um, as far as, or like what they've told me is that I'm basically their first user. So 
Um, yeah, I don't know. It might be uh, there's def definitely some some gaps in the API that you that you see here and there. And so I want to at least explore the other thing that is out there at some point. And so maybe this is a good time to uh, to look at web render. It's the only thing really that I could find where I'm like, okay, this is serious enough and close enough to what I want to do that uh, that I can use it potentially. Uh, so yeah, I just want to get the lay of the land, right? And I now understand MakePad pretty well, uh, but I don't... I haven't explored this uh, this part of the land quite yet. The other options are to keep building a larger application in MakePad. Uh, like MakePad does seem like the most likely option for me to use uh, for something like my notebook application or any other sort of application. Um, so I can keep doing that and that's quite attractive too because I can see a pretty clear path to, um, for example, build uh, yeah, built a simple version of like a uh, a ROS bag uh, debugger. And then the other thing that I can do is, uh, if you look at my last video, I had a bunch of features that I had built for my notebook, right? Like you could uh, actually write some code and compile it and it would run immediately uh, in the browser. Um, that is gone now that we use MakePad. I don't know how to do that exactly, how to kind of fuse, you know, the the user generated code with the code that you have uh, running yourself, um, uh, especially sort of in a cross-platform way, which MakePad gives you, right? Um, so yeah, you would have to figure out how to, um, how to load a binary and actually connect it to sort of like this rendering system um, on the different platforms. And so it doesn't seem too crazy complicated necessarily, but I I just don't really know how any of that works. Uh, I've only done that for the web because I'm fairly familiar with how uh, how WebAssembly works at this point. But uh, I don't I don't know how you would do this on like macOS, for example. But I'm sure I could figure that out. So that would be uh, quite interesting. That would be a bit of a different direction, right? I would say, okay, let's. Uh, Let's put this uh, GUI stuff to rest. MakePad is kind of uh, is kind of good for that. Let's uh, let's learn something different. So I don't know if it's quite the time for that yet. Maybe in a few weeks. Uh, but that is kind of where I'm at. So yeah, that is it for this week. Uh, thanks so much. I would love your feedback. If you have any any comments, I probably got a lot of stuff wrong about MakePad. So if you're like, you know, if you know more about that, uh, let me know. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, see you next week, hopefully.